it is still a hard pill for people to swallow saying, okay, but aren't there cases in which an almighty God could at least <laughs> intervene for people who are utterly helpless? I mean, what does that say about God's character that there isn't this kind of intervention, though he has the power to intervene? Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Sean LePage. I'm the chairman of the Ministry Studies Department at Calvary University. And uh, I am pleased to be joined by my fellow uh, Calvary Conversations hosts, fellow faculty members and friends, uh, Dr. Mike Dodds, Tim Haines, and Dr. Joshua Paxton. Welcome, guys. Hello. Thank you. Good to be here. Glad to be here. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you for joining us. We are uh, going to uh, explore a very difficult subject today, and that is the suffering uh, of mankind, uh, the suffering and the biblical worldview. In other words, um, uh, and perhaps you've asked this question, um, how can a good God allow uh, people, innocent people, to suffer? And uh, wh why does he allow this to go on? And uh, so, gentlemen, we're going to explore this together, and we want to especially focus on, um, you know, what we might say if if we were uh, gathered around this table with, with uh, say, an unbeliever or someone who's curious about the Christian faith and how how we reconcile the suffering in the world with a with a the teaching that uh, God is a God of love and mercy. And and so that's our focus. Our, our our audience this for this conversation is is uh, the the unbeliever or the curious or even the new believer who doesn't um, doesn't understand how this could be. So um, I think you know I'm I'm confident that each of you gentlemen has had this conversation with someone at, at one point or another. And so um, take turns here, and I'll I'll let. Uh, Dr. Paxton, get us going here. Um, you know, what? what is your short answer to that question? Uh, why does a perfectly good and infinitely powerful God allow suffering? So the first time you ask, the first time you ask the question, you, why does a good God allow good people or good people or nice people, et cetera, to, to suffer? And, and even that question itself, uh, betrays a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the reality of suffering from a biblical worldview. And, and that is from a, from our human perspective, we, we would say that people don't deserve to to suffer um mm -hmm. however from the biblical worldview we go all the way back to genesis 3 and we understand that the the reality of all suffering that exists in the world is fundamentally because we live in a a fallen world we we chose this world adam and eve chose to disobey the one command that God gave them not to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in doing so, they invited sin into the world. And as a result of the condition of a world which is now given over to disobedience <laughs> to its creator, suffering is a natural consequence of, of what we have, of the reality that we experience. And so, it's it's a biblical worldview quite honestly is is the only worldview that actually provides us with a reliable understanding for why suffering exists the the naturalist the the humanist has no basis from which to define suffering if if our world is merely a the result of random cosmic chance and a million different parallels and natural selection, et cetera, then uh, honestly, we have no basis on which to say people shouldn't suffer or people should suffer or this. It's just this is the reality that we live in. But when we fundamentally understand that God created the world good. 
and it was, you know, Genesis tells us the end of Genesis chapter one, it was very good. And then suffering is introduced as a result of our own choice and our own disobedience. Then it provides us a much greater framework to understand why suffering is, how we are supposed to deal with it on, on this side of, of the fall. Good. If I could Good. push back a little bit on that one uh, in the spirit <laughs> of Calvary Conversations. Oh, dear. So let's, uh, let's because I, 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 there, there's, there is, I agree with you from the standpoint of what Scripture presents, but what I, what I don't agree with is that that's necessarily a satisfying answer to somebody who says, but wait, it, you're talking about an ancestors thousands of years ago. Uh, why, why is that sin being visited on me? That doesn't seem very just. Why wasn't I given a choice uh, to, to follow God or not follow God? Um, this, this all, I mean, it's, it's sure it solves it from a logical perspective for you to push the, uh, the blame back on mankind, uh, you know, back in that day, but it doesn't seem, it seems awfully vindictive of God to continue to visit judgment or the allow, allow that judgment of sin of, of being in a fallen world of having all of this, uh, catastrophe and, and chaos and, and, and trouble happen to us. It just seems pretty unjust to have that visited, um, upon people who had no choice in the matter. So I think it's important to understand that there are different kinds of suffering, um, okay. right? So, so and, and there are different layers of it. And within Christendom, um, you know, we might say, okay, it's, it's one thing for those of us who believe that we have um, an eternal destiny with God in a place where there will be no suffering to deal with uh, suffering that happens to us now in life. Um, and that suffering may be of the type uh, that is brought about by um, bad things and unexpected things that happen to us uh, that are just part of living in a fallen world, like disease or, you know, accidents, et cetera, right? Uh, the, that suffering could even be brought about as the result of our own bad choices, right? So that's that's another source of suffering. If we, if we look at the things that cause us pain, okay, uh, one would be sort of random impersonal events like an accident or an earthquake or 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 a cancer diagnosis right uh, we say random yet we believe god is is sovereign over all of that but but um it's a random from our perspective um then there is uh the suffering that that's brought about by our own poor choices but there's a third category of suffering that i think is the hardest to deal with of all and that is the suffering of innocent people who have no choice in the matter. Um, I I could tell you some pretty horrible stories of things we encountered when working with an organization. You now we worked with the Russian branch of this organization uh, that served orphans in Russia. But some of the things that happened, uh, especially particularly on in, in on the African continent, to some young girls who are part of cultures where people believe they can do some pretty horrendous things to these young girls to rid themselves of AIDS that permanently damage these girls physically and psychologically. How do you reconcile that kind? See, that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of visceral example that 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 comes up when I talk to atheists about the existence of God. Uh, it's like innocent people who suffer at the hands of evil people who have no choice in the matter, who can do nothing about it. We could bring up the Holocaust as a famous example of this, right? Um, and, and, and so I think grappling with that level of suffering, because yes, we, we may understand intellectually, even we as Christians understand intellectually, yes, uh, suffering exists uh, ultimately because uh, of the fall. And I agree with you, Josh, in that it provides an explanation Right. And that without God, uh, there is no real explanation for why we, we would even perceive that as suffering or perceive that as a wrong state. But we do. And that's 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 important. But uh, to it is still a hard pill for people to swallow saying, OK, but aren't there cases in which an almighty God could at least <laughs> intervene for people who are utterly helpless 
I mean, what does that say about God's character that there isn't this kind of intervention, though he has the power to intervene? Does that make sense? Because that's that's a really different kind of suffering. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. And it's I, I think it still ties back to the fall in that the people who are perpetrating those particular atrocities and they are atrocities um, are are doing so as a result of their sinful fallen condition. But even intellectually understanding that doesn't necessarily help you deal with the real life practical situation of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dr. Dodds, jump in yes, there. Sir. How do you how do you approach this conversation with people? How do you how do you uh, address <laughs> this question? Well, again, it depends on who you're talking to. I, let me step back as I'm, I, you know, in our conversation offline before, and we said we're going to focus on somebody that maybe is not a believer or not a Christian or doesn't, you know, read the Bible. Um, it, this is definitely a worldview issue for everybody. Uh, if you take it from a naturalistic worldview, we're suffering. Well, that's just part of the world. Suck it up. You know, make the best of it and die. And get it over with. Uh, so we commit suicide. We do. But so it's interesting here. Naturalistic people look at Christians and say, there's no God because, well, follow your own theory, <laughs> your own thinking, Very your own good. worldview. And, th- and then we run into, and here's part of the problem. We run into religious people that don't have a good answer. I remember hearing a very religious person, if I said the context, you know, it, uh, they're not an evangelical Christian, but they claim to follow the Bible, claim to believe in the God of the Bible. And when that question came up to them, this is a person who called themselves a moral theologian. They said, well, this is what God does. He comes and puts his arm around us and says, I understand. And that's all they could say. And so an outsider looking at that, if that's what they think religion is saying, that, well, God empathizes with you. Yes, this is not the world he created. That sounds pretty hokey, too, to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd want to follow a God like that that just has, if he has all power to create all the world, but he has, has nothing that he can do. And so I would argue for uh, a biblical worldview of suffering, which is God has done something about it. Now, I start out with, why do I struggle with suffering? Because, you know, God created you for a perfect world, perfect relationships, and that's what we're promised someday, but it's not now. All right, we, we talk about, but what, why won't God do something now? Well, I, as a parent allowed pain in my child's life so they'd grow up. All right, that that raises its own tough questions there. So there is a purpose that a good God could have for allowing pain. But but I want to come by back with the, the ultimate answer. God has done something about suffering. That's the purpose of the cross. M- moral suffering is spiritual suffering. And he does have promises that will be fulfilled. As every other prophecy has been fulfilled, there's going to be new heavens and new earth where there is no suffering. Now, that's the biblical worldview response, a little simple, because we're talking to people that, like all of us, we all struggle and we all have a lot of pain and we're looking for an answer. And I say, you know, that's good because God created you with a God-given vacuum that longs for a good God that will satisfy you. I had an assistant pastor in one church. He'd go to the hospital for us. He was our visitation pastor, our associate pastor. And he'd, he'd always pray for healing for every person. And he'd always say, God will heal you. Well, Jim, how could you claim that? He maybe heals you in this life, not very often, because he allows us to go through suffering. But he will heal you someday in heaven. I don't know how he's going to do it. I just know he will trust him. Ooh, well, okay, it doesn't hit us on the emotional level, but I live by truth, not by emotion. And I know that's hard because it sounds like we don't empathize with people, but but that's the biblical answer. Um, we we got to struggle with those. Good, good. I, I like that, Mike. That's really good. And I think one of the things you brought out there was this is complex, right? This is This is a very complex thing with many layers. And you started out by saying something like, uh, depends on who you're talking to. So I think, you know, ideally we're first going to listen and we're going to 
we're going to figure out who we're talking to, who who who's asking this question. And we're going to identify, and, too, because we all and, suffer. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just be very clear about who is who is asking this question and, and you know, what, you know, uh, what conclusions they've come to already. You know, um, but, you know, if, I guess we. I could have cleared it, clarified it for you guys. We are, I, I am thinking, you know, we're talking to somebody who's really looking for answers, you know, because some people that we talk to are just going to be emotional and they, they, they may completely believe in God. They may be, uh, you know, completely open to the God of the Bible, but they're going through something really hard and, you know, whatever they say, it doesn't really reflect, yeah, you know, and that may not exactly be the time to really give them believe. answers. Yeah. Right? That's I mean, what there's, I'm there's a time, there's a time when it's a per- to give somebody answers and there's also a time when it's appropriate to just sit with them and cry too yeah yeah Yeah, exactly exactly and i think the i think um you know we can be too quick to try to you know cover for god you know (laughs) as though he needs us to cover for him um but you know if we're talking to somebody who is genuinely uh wanting answers uh like i think about a, a kid all the time who uh, was in my youth group down in Texas, and actually he was just visiting uh, when he first came up to me and and uh, told me about something bad that had happened in his life, and and he just asked, you know, how can God allow that? Why would God allow that? And so it was he was genuinely looking for a a a clear, um, I, I would say, a philosophical answer that he could wrap his mind around and and and, and uh, agree with. Um, I'm not sure if he was at that moment looking for a biblical answer. He got one, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I mainly just sat down and, and listened to his story and then shared with him. Um, I shared with him, you know, that first of all, you know, um, you got to understand God. All right. So um, God is all good. The Bible's very clear on that. God is all good. He does care about what you're going through. It's not that he's just, you know, aloof and, un, uh, you know, disinterested. Um, he is all powerful. He is he is um, able to to do what we would consider impossible. So it's not that he was too weak to stop this thing from happening. And, um, you know, just that just that he is aware and he is uh so, you, you know, you have to start from that base and 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 then you can begin to understand, you know, um, I guess the, 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 the philosophical issues of how sin has impacted our world and and maybe some of the reasons why God still allows, even though he's all powerful and he's all good. He he uh, he does allow suffering uh, sometimes to accomplish something good to bring good out of the bad. Uh, or, or, or that kind of thing. So, Tim, so uh, I, you've been I, for yeah, a while. I, I've been chomping at the bit to say this. One of the <laughs> things that, that really concerns me in Christendom is when we feel like we have to have the answer to every possible tension. And this is, uh, so I'll speak for myself here, and I don't know if uh, the group would agree with me on this. Uh, so if you're asking, if if you are somebody who is questioning God's existence, asking, why does he allow suffering in the world when he's, he's capable of stopping it my ultimate answer to you would be i don't know uh, and i i i will i will hold that answer because i i i don't think i think any any less than that it, if we look at the book of job we had job's friends trying to create all sorts of explanations for why he was going through the suffering he did and god chastised them for it and in the end, God's answer to Job is really, I am God, and I happen to know better. Like, I have a reason, and you need to trust me in this, right? And that's a hard pill to swallow. And there's tension in Christianity because of that. Now, that does not mean that we, have, we, we don't have any good intellectual resources, or that we can make no, no valid conclusions about suffering because we don't know 100% why God allows it. Okay, here are, some, here are some things that we can say, that God deeply cares for us, so much for us that he has solved our ultimate suffering problem, right? And this is yeah. the good news of the gospel. 
And perhaps, I don't know, maybe part of the reason that suffering exists in the world is, is so that we're aware of that. If no suffering existed in the world, why would the gospel even be interesting to us, right? I mean, it would, it would, it's, it's interesting to us because it stands in opposition to uh, e eternal, um, uh, an eternal state of right being with God and right, and, and in, in, in a place where there is only goodness, it stands in stark opposition to what we have presently, okay? To, to say that God is cruel is to ignore that fact, okay, that, 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 that a provision has been made ultimately. And the other thing that we can't ignore is that there is great tension in trying to res resolve this problem by denying the existence of God, because then you have some real intellectual problems to deal with. How do you even recognize this as suffering to begin with? I would argue you recognize it as suffering because you're made in the image of God and, and you you recognize the value differences between things that would be impossible to do so if they weren't part of the fabric of reality. Um, I, I don't think you could make a judgment. I, I, I don't think that that uh, <laughs> that it's possible to resolve and and look at your own desire for there to be justice. Where does that even come from? How can you even be, you would not, you would not have the wherewithal to have the tension of asking God, how can you be just if, you would not, you would have no sense or concept of justice without accepting metaphysical realities to be true that are not explainable by the natural world. So, um, some of the best, you know, some of the best counter arguments I have for, for this, uh, for for those who would abandon God because of the suffering, actually come from the abandonment itself. There is tension in both worldviews, but I would still argue that the worldview that 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 embraces the existence of God is the only thing that can explain who we are, explain why there is suffering, and most importantly, offer the hope of a solution. Uh, and I say hope, a real hope, offer the solution to uh, the permanent solution to our suffering. So, uh, yeah, yeah so, I kind of went on there a little bit, but that's... Before you... what we're talking about, the, uh, the nature of God as well, Tim, to piggyback and take it a little bit a step further. People, what is God, people's conception of God? And... Um, there are gods, there are religions that believe that their God created all the pain. Mm. Uh, is that what we believe biblically? He cursed the world. He allowed it, though, as a result of the fall. All right, see, I'm bringing in Christian scriptures. But our conception of God, uh, it is definitely a big part of this. And, and what is our, should our God be like? Is, is he capricious? Is he always going to be good? Uh, okay, anyway. I want to piggyback uh, off what you were saying. I like, yeah. I, I really enjoy how we're circling around the character of God. Sean, you yeah. wanted to say something, yeah. and then I, I really, really, really want to tell you all a story, but okay. go ahead, Sean. <laughs> well, Tim, I'd like you to follow up. You you said something to the effect of that, you know, that that God God is the only possibility of, a, of real hope. Mm -hmm. um, Let's not assume that everybody knows what you're what you mean by that. So we and we're talking about that? the God and we're talking about the God of the Bible. Right. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, uh, uh, the world no. and we are not as we should be because of sin that entered the world. And yes. we know it. I mean, I think if, if you're listening to this and, and you, you know, if you look in your heart of hearts, something is wrong. Something needs to be made whole. Something is missing. I just really believe every human is aware of that. We're reaching for all sorts of crazy, crazy things in food or sex or drugs or entertainment or whatever it is to fill that gap, to fill that hole. When it is, uh, as Pascal said, a God-shaped hole in your life, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, the incarnation of, 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 of the divine mystery, the incarnation of God into flesh, right? To come, to experience life here on earth, and ultimately to die on a cross, to pay for our guilt so that we can be made right before God. That is the gospel. And as a result of that, we are now God's children, and we will spend eternity with him after we pass from this earth. And I, I just... 
I think there's so much to be, I don't know, even if you just look at the history of man, even men who, even people who, who, uh, you know, have no concept of Christianity, there are these concepts of, of guilt, of needing things to be made right, of knowing that there's something that waits us beyond this world. Like all of those things are just, I, I, what is Ecclesiastes, that he has set eternity in our hearts, right? That even our desire to live forever, even your even your self-awareness, how, how you are radically different from the rest of the world, around, all points to the God who created you. And that same God has made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, for you to be reconciled with him, for you to have peace in your soul through the trouble on earth, not necessarily a better life, right from the standpoint of your circumstances being better but better from from the standpoint of you uh being connected with what is ultimately important and ultimately you spend eternity with him like that's that's the gospel and we just need to receive it to receive that and and say that jesus is who he said he was and that his work on the cross is what he said it was too (laughs) that's That's the gospel very good tim and and uh i i would add you know that god also promises (laughs) that he will set everything right. You know, it's not just that we as individuals get to get, get to escape this world and, and be with him forever, but he promises to set it all right again. Um, the, the book of Revelation says uh, that, that, that God will announce, behold, I am making all things new. Uh, yeah. he, is, he is a God of newness. He is making us new now, but he will ultimately restore everything and, and and completely do away with death and sin and the curse that brings so many problems on this world. He's going to do away with that. He is going to end all this someday. Right. So so uh, nice. there is hope. And, and I don't know of any any other uh, uh, faith system that provides that kind of hope. So, mm. um, Josh, tell us your story. Can I tell my story? Okay, so I fundamentally are how we deal with with suffering comes back to the question of can you can you trust God? Can you can you trust him in, in spite of your experience? Can you can you trust him to to be a, doing the right thing? Can you trust that he has your best interest in mind, regardless of what you may have gone through? What you know, whether it was natural causes or somebody else did something to you or whatever it is. Can you can you trust that he, your heavenly father still has your best interest at heart? Right. So. <clears throat> So so here's my story. Um, a number of years ago, I think one one of my one of my twins. So I have two twins. Uh, one of my twins got got sick, and this is going to be relevant for all of you because you know my my crowd because your fathers, and and it speaks to the fatherly character of God. And I I recognize right. Okay, let me say right off the bat, I recognize that. Not everyone's experience of fatherhood is good. I, I recognize that. Okay, um, but but this is something that really helped me to better understand the the reality of the difference between me and and my heavenly Father. Okay, and and I say that you know contextually speaking, I've had two kidney transplants and I've been on dialysis. I I am acquainted with suffering, um, but one of my twins got sick and he he was so sick that he was getting dehydrated, and so we made the decision to go ahead and take him to the emergency rooms to to get some fluids in him because we were worried about him getting too dehydrated. And so we get to the I get to the emergency room. I took him. I get to the emergency room. Uh, we walk back. He's examined by a doctor. The doctor's like, yes, it's good that you brought him in. We need to get some IV fluids in him so that he can he can get over this. So so here we are. We're in the emergency room. <clears throat> I'm laying next to him on on the bed. Heads up here, right? Here's his body. Uh, I'm holding on to this arm so that he he can't do anything. And walks, um, you know, like the rock uh, an orderly who the guy was built and and he he clamps down on my son's knees he's not going anywhere okay uh two nurses come in 
Uh, you know, he's he, he's like three, four years old, something like that. Uh, two nurses come in. One of the nurses holds his arm straight so that he can't do anything while she's putting the IV in. The other nurse puts in the IV. OK, so picture this in your heads and you're four years old. <clears throat> My son. Over and over and over the entire time this is ha happening is screaming at the top of his lungs. Help me, daddy, help me. <laughs> and the three of you who are fathers just felt that in your soul, didn't you? I mean, I'm I'm there and I am helping him, right? <laughs> I'm I'm giving I'm giving him exactly what he needs in that moment so that he can recover from from this sickness because I know that the consequences of being dehydrated is that he can die. I mean, people die of dehydration, OK? Uh, I realize the consequences. His four-year-old mind cannot comprehend the consequences, the, the potential consequences, if he does not endure what's happening to him right now. All he knows is this hurts. I want it to end. And and I want my daddy to make it stop. I want my daddy to make the pain stop, right? Um, and in that moment, you know, it's all the suffering I've ever been through in my life, two kidney transplants, dialysis, you know, surgeries, whatever, you know, boom, there's the light bulb. That right there is the fundamental difference between me and my heavenly father. That's he knows the outcome. He he knows he knows the results. He knows the the consequences if I don't endure this period of suffering. He he knows the good that can potentially come out of this regardless of how painful it is in the moment. And in that moment, my son needed to do one thing. He needed to trust that his daddy is helping him, even if it hurts. And and in that moment, when you know when it's you and you're on the gurney and you're going through the suffering, you, you need that one thing to trust the character of our heavenly Father as it's revealed in Scripture that regardless of how horrible this is, He is good. And and he knows he knows what you don't know. So that's, that's my good, story. Josh. It's a, it's a good illustration, and I think you know in our limitations, we are like a child, right? <laughs> we 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 are like children in that we don't see everything, we don't know everything, we we don't know mm -hmm. the future. And you know in that in that situation, if you as his father would have removed the temporary evil of of being restrained and and the scary people and everything you would have uh, allowed a greater evil to happen yes and, and 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 then and then also you know i think about how how uh so often we we don't know uh what god is doing behind the scenes we don't know what things he has stopped like yes. we may be in a car accident and be saying god why didn't you stop this it might be that uh you know he's he's stopped uh, 12 or 13 uh you know uh, auto accidents uh, already that month you know so we, we don't know uh so so we're so limited and and i think it's a good illustration and i often think of uh how our limitations really do um make us like children uh so gr great illustration um i think we're going to end on that uh, actually um it's it's uh you know, I'm, my hope is, uh, listener, that this has been helpful to you uh, to just to just uh, hear some of this uh, conversation today uh, as we as we uh, address the the, uh, the kind of the philosophical but yet theological ideas of why a good God could allow suffering. And if you're if you're uh, still open to to hearing more, uh, we are going to have a second conversation where we're going to talk. Um, more uh, directly and thoroughly uh, about the theology and how um, uh, really actually Christ invites us to share in his sufferings 
uh, for this world. And uh, and again, um, even as he promises that ultimately it will be worth it. So um, thank you, gentlemen, for your insight and your stories. And and uh, thank you, listener, for for joining us for this important conversation. Grace and peace. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Calvary Conversations, a service of Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. We invite you to participate in the conversation by contacting us through the Calvary University website, calvary.edu, or by calling us at 816-322-0110. Join us again next week for another Calvary Conversation.